Four Degrees to the Streets is designed to empower anyone curious about places and spaces, not just persons with professional degrees or backgrounds. Here we will cover a host of topics, including transportation, health, housing, and the environment through the lens of racism, classism, and sexism, and give listeners the tools they need to overcome institutional barriers. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram at the number four degrees pod and tune in every other Tuesday where Nemo and Jazz keep it four degrees to the streets. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to episode seven of the four degrees to the streets podcast. I'm so excited to be here with you guys today. Today's episode is really cool. We're going to be talking about sports in the city, given that the Super Bowl just finished. Super excited for Tom Brady to have his seventh, I think, Super Bowl ring, which is more than any other quarterback and now any other team in National Football League history. But Nemo, let's check in with you. How you doing, girl? I'm well, I, I can't complain. Um, this was an interesting episode for me as anyone who knows me knows I'm not a huge sports person, <laughs> but you know, it, it's, it, was, it was interesting to, to get into and I know a lot of people are, so I'm sure as you all are listening, we'll have thoughts and, and some hot takes. What's your favorite sports team or do you have a favorite sports team? Um, I guess since we're talking about football today, the two football teams that I guess I've been raised to like (laughs) is the Seahawks, given where I grew up, um, and then the New Orleans Saints, uh, given where I was born and where my, and where my, my mom is from. What about you? Um, I'm from Jersey. I'm a New York football and New York basketball fan, which means it's really tough for me because we always do so poorly I was about to say is it that tough (laughs) the Knicks are my favorite basketball team and I mean right now they're doing much better but usually they're really bad and I'm a Giants fan I don't mess with the Jets at all (laughs) okay that makes sense all I knew from my time in the (laughs) tri-state area was that the Jets were bad um worse than bad. So we're going to be talking about sports in the city, particularly the deals that go on between sports teams, NFL teams for this episode, um, and local governments. And so if a lot of you guys have live in cities where there is a sports team, whether you're in DC or New York or Atlanta or Chicago or LA, Um, major cities have sports teams and there's a big field out here around sports economics and um, urban planning and public policy that have different opinions on whether or not local governments and state governments for that matter should support financially the construction of large professional sports stadiums particularly NFL stadiums major league baseball soccer and foot and basketball stadiums and so I'm going to talk about some of the reasons why people believe or their argue, the arguments for investment in public stadiums from local governments. And so there are kind of two main reasons. Um, the first is that stadiums and the create the development of them through construction and then their operation create jobs for the local community. And so during construction, there's going to be X hundreds of jobs in the construction process and in the demolition process of an older stadium, electricians, technicians, plumbers, elevator repair people, all of those people create jobs, but those construction jobs are temporary. And then there's the jobs that are inside the stadium, the ticket sales, the concessions, the parking um, attendance, the valet attendance, those are all jobs created from the stadium being there. And then there's the hope for job growth outside of the stadium in shops and restaurants that get built up around the stadium. So think about LA Live in Los Angeles around the Staples Center, the different restaurants that are in that area. That's the idea, one idea behind why local governments should invest in stadiums. And then the second idea is this multiplier effect, which is that 
the stadium being there creates those jobs and construction inside the stadium and then outside the stadium in close proximity. But that then creates extra buying power for those employees who then shop at other businesses. And that gives those businesses more buying power so they can have more employees. And that's kind of the multiplier effect. Um, And what's important to remember about these two things is that it's all expectations. We expect a certain number of jobs within the construction. We're expecting a certain number of jobs within the stadium, but we really don't know what's going to happen outside the stadium or in the larger realm of the community with the multiplier effect. I think it's a good thing that you mentioned about the expectation, because basically what I'm about to tell you is why that's all cap, (laughs) why it's not true. Um, that it's a hope, um, but very rarely do cities actually see it. Um, and so some of the reasons why there's arguments in, again, the field of sports economics for why cities and local governments and taxpayers should not be responsible for funding stadiums is that a lot of those expectations do not actually end up benefiting the taxpayers in the way that they want it to. A lot of the jobs that Jasmine mentioned are not necessarily jobs that especially once the stadium is built, a lot of the permanent long-term positions are not necessarily enough for people to have a living wage um, and to support a family um, and for things that will really build up the tax base if that's what the expectation is. Another piece of why the expectation for for stadiums should not fall on the taxpayers is the opportunity cost is really high. These stadiums are huge. They take up a lot of land. They're expensive to build. Um, and, uh, you know, the average cost of an NFL stadium is anywhere between in the hundreds of millions. Um, we'll get into some more of the details later about the specific stadium that we're referring to. And so the idea is that those millions of dollars can go back to the community and things that will actually benefit them, whether that's education, housing, those things have long-term positive consequences. And so when you think about the revenue that a stadium generates, which is about 145 million per year, none of that is actually going back to the community. All of that is going back to the franchise. And so it's like these franchises, these football teams have the money. And so we're helping billionaires pay for a service that they can truly already afford. And when you think about that, going back to the community, a survey that was done a few years ago for the stadium in Baltimore, um, which you can think about as a area that uh, is not the most economically advantaged, but struggles in some ways. Um, 85% of the stadium attendees just went to the game and went home. There was nothing around that made them continue to stay and spend money in the city. And so, as I mentioned, NFL teams um, are worth a lot of money. Their net value is over $3 billion. Um, And so this is just to kind of put a context to that the resources that they have to really fund the stadium and the cities and the locations for where they want to be. Um, For example, the Dallas Cowboys, they have a net, they have the highest net value at 5.7 billion. Um, And then the 49ers, the San Francisco 49ers have a net value of 3.8 billion. Um, The lowest value team, which still is a lot of money, (laughs) is the Cincinnati Bengals at 2.8 at $2 billion. And so when you think about funds and limited resources that cities actually have to you know, provide for their residents and to improve their community, these teams are coming in with billions of dollars that they have to kind of just do free reign and do whatever. Um, and so cities, a lot of cities, even some of the most populous cities do not on a daily basis, year to year, have enough to cover their own debts for just you know, basic infrastructure to keep the city going. Um, Most of these cities can hold up to $323 billion in debt. Um, And so you're coming, you think about football teams coming in, they're at a positive of revenue and resources that they have. Um, And so in specifically in San Francisco, um, taxpayer burden is about $17,000. And so the population was at, is the population in San Francisco, for instance, would have to have an additional $17,000 to bring bring the city out of their debt. So a lot of times when football teams are moving into these cities, they already have a laundry list of things that they have to account for. And adding the construction of a stadium is just one other thing. 
Yeah, I think that's the worst part about it. The opportunity cost of saying, okay, I'm the city of San Francisco or I'm the city of Los Angeles and I have um, education programs to fund. I have homelessness services to fund. I have to fix potholes in my roads. I have bridges that might be do for repair. I have a transit system that needs expansion. All of these things that are already kind of written down in plans as, they, as their goals. I have pensions that need to be funded 50 years in advance for a current employee. Um, and so if I have the opportunity to say I have $500 million, there's a million things I can do with that money. Is it really the best bang for my dollar to give that to an NFL team or to give that to a basketball team with the hopes that it's going to turn into construction jobs, part-time jobs, minimum wage jobs? Or can I make that investment in schools, for example, which would mean that I'm increasing my per pupil dollar so that every student has more resources or there's more teachers per student? There's a million ways they can spend the money. And I think when you look at the value of the NFL teams and the debt that cities are in, it just doesn't make any sense. One entity has a positive net worth. Another entity is consistently carrying debt and that entity is paying for the home basically of another person. It's basically the equivalent of Bill Gates coming to you, Nemo, and saying, can you buy me a house? Right, exactly. It should be the other way around. The city, the the football team should actually be paying the cities to even just take up space and resources and energy and all the things that they consume when just a game happens and how it really just takes over the city for the whole day. So we're going to be focusing on um, the San Francisco 49ers, mostly because they recently in 2014 moved from one stadium in San Francisco to a new stadium, the Levi Stadium in Santa Clara, California, which is in the Silicon Valley. It's about 45 miles away from their previous stadium, which was in San Francisco. There were a multitude of teams we could have focused on. The Atlanta Falcons just got a new stadium, the Mercedes-Benz Stadium. Um, There's plans for new football fields in DC. And so we chose the 49ers because they just got a new stadium and we found that there was the most information available on, on that deal. We are by no means experts <laughs> in this field. Um, Nemo does work in some public administration, but we are getting this information from a multitude of sources, Forbes, um, the Santa Clara Stadium Authority's website, um, a lot of reputable news sources and trying to pull together a better understanding for our listeners of this deal and how it's problematic. But we're, we're in no way experts and we're gonna have all of our notes in the show notes for this episode. And so we ask you to go there and read through it yourself. And if it's something you're really curious about, we'll be giving more resources to sports economics literature at the end of the episode. I like how you said it's problematic. (laughs) Like we're gonna just start, we're gonna get to it because it is, we just told you the reasons. Yeah, so opening up, the San Francisco 49ers are the football team for the San Francisco area. Um, They have won five NFL championships, Super Bowls, Um, their last being in 1995, so they're about due for one. They appeared in both the 2012 and 2020 um, Super Bowls, and they lost each time. Maybe if they had a different quarterback, they would have been able to do a better job. But moving forward, um, the team started in 1949 as part of the American Football League, which then became the NFL. Um, In the 1950s, they became part of the NFL. They have had two prior stadium locations to Levi Stadium in Santa Clara. They played in Kessler Stadium up until 1970, which you can kind of understand why they would have wanted to leave there. It's in the heart of San Francisco, inside of Golden Gate Park, 
um, and it was a very small stadium. So in 1970, they moved from there to Candlestick Park, which is in the Bayview um, Hunter Point, Bayview Heights neighborhood in San Francisco. So it's kind of off to the um, eastern portion of the city, kind of bounded by one of their interstate highways. And they moved there in 1970, and they were there until 2013. And that neighborhood is a low income neighborhood as most stadiums are located in lower income neighborhoods for those reasons that we mentioned above that the potential for job creation and job growth. So it's like, okay, let's put it in the most uh, desolate part of our city. But, and Nemo's gonna talk about the, the demographics of, of Bayview, but there's also an interesting caveat because it means that the land is cheaper. And so it, and they usually have the ability to tear down large swaths of land or utilize um, already existing vacant land. So not just for the potential economic value, but there is some incentive to not put the stadium inside of San Francisco's most expensive neighborhood because now you're upsetting wealthy residents, you're tearing down $2 million, $3 billion homes when you could really tear down a $500,000 home or something like that. But Nemo, let's talk about Bayview Heights and the neighborhood characteristics. Yeah, what I thought was interesting about Bay Bayview, as Jasmine mentioned, the, the team moved there in 1970. And so that was 50 years ago. And so even at that time, it was known for being a historically African American community. And it was also known as being the most economically disadvantaged part of the city. And so the team was aware of that, and they went there. And as the stadium was still located there, um, you know, throughout the years, building projects started to come into the town, they were plans to revitalize. Um, the housing prices rose in the city 342% just between 1996 and 2008. And so all that time, the stadium was still there. And thinking about those time periods in the late 90s and early 2000s, a lot of African-American residents were no longer able to afford their homes as these new projects were coming in and new developments were coming into the town. And even the African-American population also declined in the 90s between 1990 and um, 2000, it declined by 65%. And so even though Bayview is still an, is still a really diverse area, the African American population specifically declined um, in the last 10 years. And so even in 2019, Bayview is currently 32% Asian, 23% Hispanic or Latinx, um, and 20% Black. So Blacks are no longer the majority as they once were in the 1970s and the remaining part of the 90s. Um, it's 11% uh, white, 5.6% 5 5 two or more races, 3.7% native Hawaiian, 2.5% American Indian. So as I mentioned, it's still a pretty diverse area. And overall in San Francisco, in you know present day, the median home values have actually fallen um, since 2011. So if the stadium left in 2013 and there was you know signals that home prices were dropping, um, even the household income is $43,000, and that was in 2009. So overall, you think about the growth of the San Francisco area, Bayview is still in a pretty low position. And so you may wonder, like, well, what was happening in the 90s? There was all this development. People were getting pushed out. One could even assume, you know, gentrification was on the rise. It seems that once the stadium left, a lot of the plans to redevelop Bayview also left. Yeah. It's interesting to think that a lot of the plans left, but I, I wonder how much the stadium actually played a role or how much the attention of city council was like focused on helping incentivize development there to kind of bring to fruition the expectation of the stadium creating jobs and opportunity. Does that make sense? Yeah, I know that does. It seems like they were almost trying to cover themselves to be like, look, look, we bought the stadium here. Other great things are happening. We promise. Yeah. Um, and then they're like, oh, okay, well now we don't have to worry about it anymore because the stadium left. So no, I think that's a, I think that's a really fair, fair analysis. Um, but it's completely unfair to the residents who live in that surrounding area to be thrown around based on the expectation of what government had promised or what a new stadium had promised. In stadiums, 
and we were talking about this earlier, but it seems like big institutional infrastructure projects are consistently being pushed into lower income areas of the city. You think about hospitals, universities, stadiums, convention centers, amusement parks, they're always in the lower income part of the city with this expectation that they're going to generate economic development. And we've all been to those places and you drive there, you park your car at that location, you go inside, you leave and you drive out. And when you're leaving, you're always looking at the neighborhood looking like, oh, wow, the houses here are so small compared to where I live and the roads are so unmaintained. And it's like that just because the stadium is there doesn't absolve the reality that these people don't earn enough money and they're not making enough money to support themselves and their families and a lifestyle that is equivalent to where you're driving from. It's just not the reality. Right. And I think we both talked about an experience. I think you said you were at MetLife and I had an experience at the um, New Orleans Superdome where after an event, we were like stranded, couldn't, (laughs) there was nowhere to go. There was no coffee shop to sit and wait for an Uber. There was no, there was nowhere you could just sit and hang out at a bar. Um, But we were literally in the, in like, well, at least from my, in my experience, I was literally in a neighborhood (laughs) staring at people's houses with a mass of people trying to get out of the stadium and find transportation. Um, And so it was like, well, what was that area promised when the stadium came and, and has it, have they been, have they got it? Luckily for MetLife, it's located in a swamp. So they don't have, it's a caucus area. It's a highway and wetlands and marshlands. Um, And so they just put a new mall there. So it's really, it really is a destination to drive to and experience large infrastructure projects and then to exit. Um, Even the Secaucus NJ Transit Station you still have to like get on a separate shuttle bus to the arena in the mall because they're not connected at all. I don't think I ever got off at Secaucus. I just remember (laughs) passing it and knowing that like, okay, they look, but yeah, it's like almost intimidating um, if you're you're not in a car, which we talk about a lot (laughs) on on this podcast. Um, So it's like, how do you really access it? It's not, it's not bringing people to the area. Yeah, and from a sustainability perspective, stadiums are very, very wasteful. Um, Particularly um, NFL stadiums because they have a single use. Um, A lot of them do. I know the Mercedes-Benz Stadium is also used for um, other events and MetLife Stadium. I went there to see Beyonce, but a lot of them have the simple purpose of being used for a football field. And for a team, I think the NFL has 17 games a season and there's 32 teams that means there's what four home games like maybe um and so even the economic value of like the jobs that someone has inside the concession stand I don't know how you earn a living wage if the your your job is only open for four days like for seven hours like how much money can you actually make But from a sustainability perspective, the shelf life of stadiums is very, very short. There are very few stadiums, NFL stadiums in particular, that have existed for a long period of time and the team is still lived there. Some of the longest are um, Lambeau Field, which opened 65 years ago, which is where the Green Bay Packers play, Soldier Field, um, where the Chicago Bears play, um, and Wrigley Field, which is where the Cubs play. I hope I got that right, but it's where the soccer team for Chicago, I mean, the baseball, (laughs) the baseball team for Chicago plays. And those have been in in operation um, for between 50 and 60 years. That's a pretty long time. Um, But in many places, the shelf life is much shorter. Thinking about Atlanta, the Falcons, which is their football team, they played in Fulton County Stadium for only 23 years. They tore down Fulton County Stadium, replaced it with the Georgia Dome. They only played there for another 24 years. And they recently tore down the Georgia Dome to build the Mercedes-Benz Stadium. How long are they going to be there? 20 years? It's wasteful because why can't the stadium be retrofitted? You buy your house, you're at least on a 30-year mortgage. And if you want to modernize your house, you know, you want now an open concept floor plan, or you want a white kitchen, or you want bigger glass windows, you want a greater outdoor space, 
you make those changes inside your house to modernize it. With stadiums, it's like tear the whole thing down and build it up again with basically the same functions and operations, just brighter and shinier. So when the Falcons left the Georgia Dome, they wanted a bigger stadium with more space and more modern amenities. That stadium is humongous. It's 2 million square feet. Let's just start there. That's a big space. Um, and it's like you could have stayed in the dome and retrofitted it. There could have been a way to do it so that we're not wasting materials, wasting money. I'm sure that the city of Atlanta is still paying off the bonds on the Georgia Dome while you guys are off building, again, more money in the Mercedes-Benz Stadium. It's just very, very wasteful. And I'm curious if they're saying that they wanted it to be bigger, like were all those seats even being filled up at every game? <laughs> like questions that need answers to say they need more space. I do think it's interesting to note um, as we found through getting ready for this episode that between 1987 and 2000, there were 25 NFL stadium projects, as Jasmine mentioned, a lot of them play in, stadium, in the stadium for under 30 years. And so between that time period of 1987 and 2008, cities and taxpayers actually paid for about 70% of the total construction cost, which is just like wild. And so I think, again, a lot of these sports econ economics um, economists <laughs> started catching up. And since 2009, the public contribution has dropped. So now about 25% of the total construction costs usually come from cities. Um, so it's like, why? <laughs> why was the public putting that bill in, in the late, you know, in the late part of the last century <laughs> into the early 2000s. What a sentence, the late part of the last century. <laughs> 31, now like I'm trying to figure out the decades <laughs> and what was going on. Um, but we're gonna go ahead and take a break and we're gonna dive, in. when we come back, we're gonna dive into specifically the deal that happened in Santa Clara and the San Francisco 49ers stadium. Four Degrees to the Streets podcast brings you Block by Block, a new segment highlighting infrastructure developments from all across the world. This week's Block by Block will highlight a virtual exhibit available through the National Building Museum titled Documents and Crossroads, the Coronavirus in Poor Minority Communities. The National Building Museum was founded in 1980 and is dedicated to transforming the public's understanding of the impact of architecture, engineering, landscape architecture, construction, planning, and design. Between March 8th and April 4th, 2020, award-winning urban documentarian Camilo Jose Vergara documented the evolution of poor segregated communities in Oakland and Richmond, California, Newark, New Jersey, Harlem, Brooklyn, Queens, and the Bronx, New York, all as they were being affected by the coronavirus at that time. Vergara shares that density and diversity make these spots prime locations for observing a host of interactions and behaviors, from shopping habits and fashion trends to familiar interactions and health practices. In short, these hubs reveal the precautions residents of these segregated communities are or are not taking to avoid being infected and spreading the coronavirus. This theme is explored in the companion exhibits, Documenting Crossroads, The New Normal, published in late June 2020, and Documenting Crossroads, Survival and Remembrance Under the Pandemic, published in early December, 2020. Okay, so we are back. And uh, as I mentioned, we're gonna dive into the details of the deal that, that happened between the city of Santa Clara and the 49ers, also known as Levi Stadium. And so before we even get into the nitty gritty of the project cost, how payments were distributed, who was responsible. Um, I think it's important to note that this was a ballot measure that required uh, residents to vote um, for the city to move forward with the financing plan. And so this election took place on June 8, 2010. Um, there was several different things on that ballot, including a governor and other legislative positions. Um, interestingly enough, um, Jasmine alerted me that Gavin Newsom was the mayor of San Francisco at the time, and he was running for lieutenant governor on this ballot and won. Um, and now present day in 2021, he is the governor of California. So just kind of funny how all that, <laughs> all that worked out. Um, but yeah, so there were other legislative positions, other measures that, you know, tax related um, that had to be voted on. And so 
This specific measure for the stadium was called ballot measure J. It passed with 58%. Um, but if we're carrying along the theme of things that were problematic with this deal, definitely the election and the campaign finance and outreach was a bit problematic. So mainly that the team owners and the CEO of the 49ers, Jed York, paid for 99% of the pro stadium campaign contributions. And this completely did not match the, you know, the resources that the opponents had. So the team owners paid 4.1 million in TV, radio ads, mailers, and the opposing side, the side who did not want the stadium, only had $10,000 to spend to try to reach out to 100,000 residents that were eligible to vote on this. And so there was just, it was, it was not fair from the beginning um, in terms of convincing residents to, uh, to vote yes on the stadium paying for this deal or on the city paying for the, a portion of this stadium deal. There were only 100,000 eligible voters. Yeah. Santa Clara is a really small, <laughs> a really small city for there to be so few um, eligible voters. I just realized like that's a really small number because don't, I don't know how many people, a hundred people don't show up to vote every single time. Um, and so they only needed a small fraction of the votes to, to win. Um, and if they had a bigger marketing campaign then they were bound to win. Right, because when you think about it, um, about 14,000 people voted yes, and 10,000 people voted no. So that's not that many people who participated in not that many, not that much of a difference, a 4,000 4, difference in people um, who voted. Yeah, it's a really s small election turnout. Um, and I wonder how many people just didn't select anything because they felt that they were powerless. I mean, how much, if the ballot would have came out in reverse, were they not going to fund the deal? They couldn't go to San Francisco because the mayor there had told them, I'm not giving you any more money. So were they going to move to Louisville? Like, where were they going to go? I think they would have found the way, <laughs> which, because, we, which we will get into. They found, they found some ways. <laughs> yeah, because does the city, they don't ask for our opinion on regular budget matters. I feel like that was just a a show of like, okay, we're going to put it on the ballot and let the people decide, but they don't ask us how we want to spend our tax dollars any other time. So if, if the ballot would have came out different, they were still going to fund the stadium. <laughs> like it's no way around that. They wanted the deal to happen. So it's interesting. We talked about the ballot measure. I did bring up just now that they were previously in San Francisco at Candlestick Stadium. They wanted a new stadium um, and the mayor of San Francisco said no. So they shopped around for another city in the general area so they could keep themselves being the San Francisco 49ers. They found Santa Clara and that's how the story went. So in 2010, when the deal became um, public, the total project cost was projected to be $937 million, with 53% of the cost being fronted by the 49ers and the NFL, somewhere around $493 million. Just 12% was going to be funded directly by Santa Clara, the city of Santa Clara. The um, remaining 35% was going to be funded by this stadium authority. That stadium authority is a very interesting caveat to the deal because it's technically not the city of Santa Clara, but it's, com it's comprised of the city council and the mayor. So it essentially is made up of the city of Santa Clara, but it's not on paper, technically the city of Santa Clara. It's interesting because by 2014, when the stadium was finished, it ended up costing $1.3 billion. So something like uh, $400 million or yeah, $400 million more. And um, we're gonna talk about the stadium authority, but just to give you a breakdown, the stadium authority has been able to pay their costs because they got a loan from banks and the 49ers. So that's interesting. The 49ers have an affiliate called Stadium Co. 
and um and there's another one they have two affiliates that loaned money to the stadium authority so that the stadium authority could fund the project so the stadium authority's debts are to the 49ers so the 49ers fronted the money to the stadium and the stadium pays the 49ers back plus interest so not only did they have the money to fund the stadium they did some creative accounting to shift it over and the stadium authority pays back the interest on their debts um, through issuing a bond through revenue from um, the ticket sales and um, through a ground lease with the 49ers and um, they also instituted a new hotel tax on any hotels in a certain um, distance I think it's about a mile from the stadium there's a, a different there's a new hotel tax when you stay at that hotel um, there's fees in the parking garage and then the Silicon Valley power was there was a extra tax associated to that particular substation. So some very creative ways of generating revenue to make this stadium deal possible. I think as we go on and talk about the deal and talk about the Santa Clara Stadium Authority, I think what's important to note and keep in mind is that it sounds like it's a non-governmental body, <laughs> you know, when you, you know, the, uh, you know, the Santa Clara Stadium Authority, like you would think it's made up of, you know, maybe third parties with no personal close interest in the matter, but that's not the case. Uh, as Jasmine mentioned, it's comprised of the city's most powerful politicians, the mayor, the city manager, and members from the city council. And it really it was set up to show the public that this body was going to stand between the stadium using an excess of city's general fund revenue to cover the stadium cost. Um, and in, in that way, when we think about what was actually voted on was not the actual deal. The growth of that deal, as Jasmine mentioned, it went from 937 million to 1.3 billion. And a large percentage that took up the new project cost, the increased project cost came from the stadium authority. And the stadium authority received those funds from one of the 49ers affiliate companies, the 49ers Stadium LLC, and then also um, a $450 million investment from a, from a group of investment banks specifically led by Goldman Sachs. And so it increased the loan amount and it's now the body of the city officials responsible for accounting for these extra borrowing. And we talked a lot about in the beginning of the episode about the debt that cities already take on. And so now it's the city agreeing to take on additional debt for a stadium. And the cost difference was that in 2010, when the project costs were 937 million, the stadium authority was going to be paying 35%. By 2014, after all had been said and done, the stadium authority paid 71%, almost twice as much as they had initially agreed upon. Actually, almost three times as much. They initially agreed upon 330 million, they ended up paying $933 million. That's a lot of money. Right, and all the while to the public who at this point voted on this in 2010, the project costs changed by the time the stadium was actually developed. They're not thinking about this anymore. <laughs> All they know is they're gonna get a new stadium and it's lit, but they're not thinking about what went on behind the scenes. But even if you look on paper, it still is showing that the city of Santa Clara between the two deals in 2010 and then what the final amount was, it still appears as if they're only contributing 114 million, but it's this body of the stadium authority comprised of the local government that decided to take on additional loans from the, the 49ers affiliates and then from banks as well. It begets, the que it begets the question, if the money came from a loan, why couldn't the 49ers take out the loan? Because in one point, they issued the 49ers, their um, affiliates issued the loan to the stadium authority. So you had the capital because you issued a loan. You could have used your capital on the construction of the building. So on one hand, they're not paying for the stadium. They're actually getting paid for the stadium. They're not paying the cost, but the stadium authority has to pay them back in interest. So that interest is gonna be revenue for the 49ers. So the stadium authority is paying the 49ers 
to have the stadium in Santa Clara. Right. And you would think that the 49ers wanted a new stadium and wanted to go to Santa Clara. And like most projects, the project cost increases over time. Um, the, you know, a lot of things are based on estimates and things change. You would think the 49ers, again, coming into the town, and we talked a lot about the worth of the NFL team seeing, oh, this project's costing more. And so I think that's a good question about why did they see that the project was costing more and didn't increase their portion um, and their responsibility, but then it fell on the stadium authority to pick it up. They actually decreased their portion. In the beginning, they were expecting, the 49ers and the NFL were expecting to pay $493 million. In the end, they paid $263 million, cutting their expenses in half from 53% to 20% of the overall deal. Right. And I think another thing to mention with the structure of the stadium authority being a public body made up of the city, um, but the stadium itself is privately financed through banks, through loans, and then through that portion from the 49ers, um, that that's kind of an odd uh, distribution of who's responsible um, because, you know, the Santa Clara Stadium Authority is made up of public officials. Um, they're borrowing this money for construction. But through all of the private investment that's going into the stadium, it is going to become a local government entity. It's going to be owned by the local government. And that was one of the arguments in the election to say, hey, this is a safe bet for residents to count on because at the end of the day, it's going to be owned by the city. The city has control of it. But when you think about the function and the purpose of the building for all intents and purposes, it's private. It's the 49ers stadium. It's Levi's has the naming rights. You know, none of that is directly tied to the city other than the location. Um, and so the subsidies and the, the tax exemptions that come from the stadium being publicly owned but privately financed also save the 49ers in a way because they're not having to pay for a lot of the taxes that they would if it was being seen as a private entity. Yeah, so when you think about property that is owned by a private entity, say your house, the apartment that you live in, a shopping mall, they have to pay property taxes um, as well as sales taxes for ha if, if it's a commercial space for having that space there. But if on paper, the land or the property is a public entity, then that means there's no taxes, no property taxes to be paid. And so the 49, that's what Nemo's talking about, is the 49ers don't even have to pay the typical costs associated with having a privately owned parcel of land. Right. So they don't have to pay for property taxes. They also don't have to pay for um, entertainment taxes, um, amusement, other sales taxes, and other surcharges um, that they would normally have to pay on revenue that comes from the events that are there, whether they're NFL events or non-NFL events. Um, and so in some of the research that we found, specifically the College of Holy Cross and the Department of Economics, they did a study on this of the hidden subsidies that came from this stadium being publicly owned. And what they found was that over the 20 years, the com and you compare it to a privately owned facility, that this facility is saving about 106 to 213 million. So about 100 to 200 million that they're saving in their tax, their tax responsibility that they don't have to pay because it's seen as a public entity. Um, and I think to construct a deal in this way is dangerous for cities to take public ownership of these privately run facilities, because again, it does not go back to benefiting the greater good of the community. It impacts the tax, it can impact the taxpayers in a negative way um, to have the city take on the responsibility of something that is not in essence, it's theirs on paper, but it's not theirs in terms of what can happen. And we saw in our, in one of the examples specifically Hamilton County in Ohio, they had to sell a, a hospital to cover debts um, for the Bengals Stadium. And as we recall, Bengals was the, I think the least um, profitable NFL team <laughs> uh, or the least, uh, the net value was the least profitable. Um, and so that's like, nobody wants that. You know, if, they, if residents are thinking back on when they voted to approve this, they definitely don't think that this is what's gonna be the outcome. Um, and so in that moment, it's really clear what's more important, a hospital or a football stadium. 
the piece that I want to bring up, and so the Santa Clara Stadium Authority has a website where you can look at their financial statements that they've made um, available to the public. And so I pulled, they have them for every year of operation um, since 2013, even during their construction year. So I went and looked at the fiscal year 2013, 2014, the year that the stadium was built. Um, at this time, the stadium authority had a net position of negative $6,410,129. And so that means that their assets, you calculate your net position, your net value by getting assets, the things that you own, the stadium, the land, um, any revenues, minus your liabilities, the debt that you're currently carrying. Um, they had a negative position, meaning that they had more liabilities than they had debt. Um, and then the report that was published by KPMG, they were wrote that the stadium authority had an increased liability because the construction costs increased and they did not meet their goal of selling as many seats. And so um, you can buy year long, season long seats or um, season long booths or suites, and they were only able to sell 75% of them before the construction period. So we look at a budget, it's all kind of anticipated. If you're building an apartment building, you're anticipating 100% or 95% occupancy. And your budget only works if a majority of those build, of those apartments are being rented out and they're paying on time. And so it's the same thing with a stadium. You're trying to sell as many of those seats in advance so you can use that revenue to pay off some of your liabilities. And the financial report shows that they weren't able to do that successfully, only at 75%. So I wanted to look at further years um, in 2018 and 2019, which was two seasons ago, they were in a much better position. Their net position was positive around $60 million. It resulted in a decrease in their debt. So they've been able to make um, increased additional principal payments, reducing their total debt so that that asset minus liabilities calculation increased. Their assets, however, did not increase in value. A stadium is kind of like a car. As soon as you drive it off the lot, it starts to depreciate. As soon as you play your first football game, it's now old and it might be time to, <laughs> time to get a new one. And so their assets did not increase, but their liabilities were able to decrease. And so that's why their net position was positive and more improved. But looking at their net position for the stadium authority doesn't tell you how beneficial the deal was to Santa Clara. It's unclear as to how the city of Santa Clara was improved, if at all, by having the stadium there, which are many of the, the economic benefits of stadium production that we talked about in the intro are not that the city can pay off its debt to building the stadium. That's not a benefit. You're supposed to have a positive net position when you make a deal. You don't want to be in the negative. That's how you get foreclosed. The touted benefits are that there's job creation and all of these things happening with the stadium, not that their position is positive. And so it's very unclear as to whether or not the city of Santa Clara has been improved, if at all, by having the stadium there. And furthermore, there's extra costs associated with having the stadium there that they wouldn't have had if it remained in San Francisco or was in Louisville or some other place. Those being fire, Department of Public Works, and police. So also on the Santa Clara Stadium Authority website, they have information on how much is spent on NFL game days and on non-NFL events at the stadium. And so the cost of... Um, additional Santa Clara police, additional Santa Clara public works, additional Santa Clara fire departments, as well as costs from California state police, police from neighboring towns, police from neighboring counties, as well as feeding those officers and other public employees, providing them with per diem insurance if something happens that day of the game is on average $275,000 per NFL game and an average of 180,000 per non-NFL event. And so those costs are not included in the stadium authority's budget. Those costs are not included in the construction budget of 
the stadium. Those costs are not included in the operating costs of the stadium. Those costs are borne by those different entities for the sole purpose of providing general public service the day of the game or the day of an event. Yeah, and I think a, a lot of times is that those uh, agent, those city agencies, the Department of Public Works, whether it's the Department of Transportation that are having to provide those services and also public safety services, that falls on the city. And even from the figures you gave, even if we're looking at a, a over 100,000, 200,000, and there's maybe 10 or 12 home games, that's easily looking at upwards of $2 million that the city has to account for. And a lot of times the staff are being paid in overtime, which is even more expensive than just a regular, um, their regular pay. And so these are, when you think about it again, of the benefit of a stadium for the city overall, that's overtime that these employees could be doing to actually protect the overall city <laughs> to contribute to making the city cleaner, safer. Um, but no, they're focusing their resources every other week on a stadium specifically that is a privately run entity by billionaires. Yeah, and even if, I think I read in their financial reporting that the stadium authority does repay the city of Santa Clara for some of those services, just the city of Santa Clara. They don't repay Cal State Police. They don't repay the township over police. They repay the city of Santa Clara. And so let's say 25% of those costs are being covered. Even if they are being covered, that doesn't mean that they should have used their money in the beginning to do it. Like if someone asks you to take me to the airport and you say, okay, I'll take you, just give me some gas money. That money you've rendered the service and you got repaid for it, but you could have done something else entirely with your time. That's basically the opportunity cost of them saying, okay, you can repay us for paying the police, but we also could have paid those police and did something completely different with the money, not just secure a 10 mile, a 10 hundred foot radius around the football field. Right. And I can imagine that those repayments are, like you said, never quite a one for one. Um, they might come late. You might get them a year and a half later after it's already been long gone out the city's budget. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, that this is just one example in one town. Um, and there's so many, uh, so many other examples about how these deals really play out in on a day to day basis that many of us probably don't think about if we're showing up to a game or if we're watching the stadium lights and everything as the camera zooms in. <laughs> um, maybe to some planners and sports economists, it's like a nightmare <laughs> when we think about it. Um, but how it gets played out to the public is that it's, again, it's a sport. It brings a sense of a community. It brings a sense of culture to an area. Um, and so we wanted to talk about what are alternatives that cities can do? Um, what are cities doing now that make better deals? I mentioned in the last into 20 years at least, cities are um, footing less of the bill than they had in the past. Um, it's about, you know, on average 25%. And even for this deal specifically, like we said on paper, the, t the town was only contributing 10% of the total deal. But when you think about the tax exemptions and also the um, ex externalities for the, for the staffing of city officials, you know, city um, employees, those are all costs that are not necessarily included on what bears on the on what bears on the city. And did they even see an improvement in their economic status? Did they see an improvement in jobs and overall livability? Um, and so I think uh, the New Orleans, the New England Patriots was an example of how that stadium was built in a way that was a little bit more equitable. Yeah. So when you look up um, the average cost of a stadium per um, different sports, the NFL is the most expensive. Um, and usually the public contribution to that is higher. So the average stadium cost for the NFL is around 488 million and the public usually fronts around 262 million, about half of the deal. Um, it gets significantly less as you move down with um, Major League Soccer having the lowest stadium cost at around 173 million and the lowest public contribution at around 70 million, um, a little less than, a little more than a third, 
a little more than 20% of the due. And so we wanted to look at, well, what are the other ways that stadiums are being financed and how can that be implemented, you know, nationwide? The New England Patriots are a great example because it was funded 100% by private dollars, just the way all other businesses are funded. Um, and so Robert Kraft worked with Procter & Gamble, which is the owner of um, the Gillette Razor brand, to fund the construction of his team's football stadium in um, Foxborough, Massachusetts, right outside of Boston. And that's interesting because Robert Kraft is not the wealthiest team owner, nor are the New England Patriots the wealthiest franchise. But they were able to work out a deal in which they could pay privately for the total cost of their stadium construction. No one's to say that the owner of the 49ers couldn't have done the same when the 49ers are the fifth, um, have the fifth highest net value among all of the other 32 NFL teams. Yeah, I think one of the um, the things to look at is I think really just the choice that in a way that the teams have choice in how they want to finance it. Um, we could go on to a whole other episode about the choice of new teams actually being developed in the NFL, <laughs> but that's a, that's a different, that's a different conversation. Um, and uh, when you think about just how expensive uh, football stadiums are for how little they're used, um, one of the things we found that can make arena deals more equitable is if they're multi-purpose. Um, I think again, with that sense of culture, I think sometimes teams want to have a soul um, building that is identified just for them, but there could be more use and sustainability for a facility that can do multiple things. Um, we posted before this episode, before recording this episode about the kingdom in Seattle that was demolished in 2000. And that facility had, it hosted football, baseball, and basketball. And when you think about the new stadiums that have come in the last 30 years, that almost seems unheard of. It seems like everybody wants their own facility. And so I think when thinking about these deals moving forward, I personally would like to see a lot of a lot more multi-purpose, um, multi-purpose arenas. And the uh, T-Mobile Arena in Las Vegas, which was built in 2016, also so it cost 375 million, and none of that came from the public. Um, is an instance of why of an instance of where they were able to put multiple functions in one building. Yeah, I'd like to see more um, privately funded stadiums because the way that sports teams get off or get over by saying, oh, you showed me pay for my stadium. You don't see a Chick-fil-A saying, hey, I want to put a Chick-fil-A in your neighborhood. Will you pay for it? Because Chick-fil-A is amazing and everybody loves Chick-fil-A. So if you want a Chick-fil-A, you should pay for it. Football teams get to say, or any sport gets to say, this city loves intersport name here. And this city wouldn't be the same without the, the Falcons, or it wouldn't be the same without the 49ers. So if you want to keep us and keep this camaraderie and this emotion that everyone gets by going to a game or by watching the game on TV and some type of brand identification, then you should pay for it. I'd also like to see governors... Um, and mayors say, mm, I'm cool. You can do whatever you want. Like, you want to stay here? Then stay here. If you want to leave, peace out. I'm not paying for you to have a stadium when I have students that need books. I have roads that have potholes. I have transit facilities that need to be expanded and maintained. I have homeless people that need to be serviced. I don't have the money to give you just so that people can say, I'm from Atlanta where we have the Atlanta Falcons. Right. It almost makes me curious. Like, I think it is really the the promise, the what if, the hopes, the expectations that um, encourage cities to want to have stadiums like, oh, this is going to bring jobs, this is going to bring lively, you know, a lively environment to the city. Um, but I just think there's been so much research to show that that's not the case. Um, and so moving forward, I do think that a lot of things should be done differently. When we posted this poll, on our um, social media pages, we've seen so far an overwhelming amount of uh, 
um, listeners and followers saying that no, local taxpayers should not fund the construction of sports stadiums. Um, but interestingly enough, when you think about to these ballot measures, people voted yes for this. Um, and a lot of that, as we also saw, came from aggressive campaign financing. And again, the promise of, uh, you know, of a better improved community and more jobs. I think part of the reason why a mayor might be enticed to say, okay, we'll give you money or we'll help you finance your deal is no one wants to be the bad guy. No one wants to be the mayor when the team leaves, (laughs) you know, now you look, especially if it's an election year, now you look like you can't figure things out. It's also sexy. Like a new stadium is sexy. It's like big and bright. There's a ribbon cutting. You can go to it. Maintaining the infrastructure is not sexy. (laughs) Um, Apparently having students who can read is also not sexy. Like you can't show it off the way that you can show off a new football field, a new baseball stadium, a new soccer stadium, a new basketball arena. And so I think there are a lot of emotional decisions made um, which don't benefit the residents. This becomes a larger um, conversation that we hope to have in the future episodes around budget equity and how cities should be using their money and whether or not local taxpayers should be able to say, hey, I don't want you to spend my money this way. I want you to spend my money this way instead. Um, that's a greater conversation about budgets. And I hope that we can get to have that conversation really soon. Yeah, for sure. I think that's a, I think that's a good point about kind of the political, a lot of it comes down to the political, I think the political side of it. In this episode, we focused a lot on the numbers and, uh, you know, the, what happened actually behind the deal. Um, but I think getting to the why all that happened is, is critical. And, and really the, the, the ballot almost seems like a facade having uh, residents vote on it. And as we talked about, if they didn't vote for it, what would have happened? They probably would have found another way and funded it. Um, so it's really almost a distraction or the ballot's funded, the ballot is passed and then the budget increases by half half a billion. Like <laughs> what was the, what was even the point? Um, but yeah, so that we, we covered a lot today. Um, we hope you guys enjoyed this episode, a little bit of a different take on another side of, of you know, what goes on in the city, what goes on in the streets. Um, we hope you'll continue to listen uh, we drop episodes every other Tuesday, and you can follow us at the four, the number four, <laughs> Degrees Pod on Instagram and Twitter. Peace out, y'all.